Red Square, the Kremlin, the Evil Empire, Cold War, Nikita Khrushchev, Communism. These are some of the dominant images of Russia in the Western mind, characterized so admirably by Winston Churchill as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Before all this, however, Christianity in Russia was a force to be reckoned with. While Reformation convulsed the Latin West, Christianity in the Greek East continued, mainly unaffected by these religious storms. One of the compelling case studies in the Orthodox world is Christianity in Russia. It is a fact that vibrant Christian traditions persisted outside the orbit of the Roman and Protestant constellations. The Patriarch of Moscow, the Metropolitan of Novgorod, the Blessing of the Waters, Old Believers, One Day Votive Churches, Holy Fools, the Profusion of Icons, along with the doctrine of a third Rome, are not elements familiar to many students of church history, but each are important components for the subject of religion and church in Christian Russia. The nature of Christian history in the Russian world throughout the Middle Ages and well into the early modern period was so substantial that it's actually possible, I think, to make a case that society in Russia during the 16th and 17th centuries particularly was governed by religious considerations. The role of religion, in fact, the Christian faith I'm speaking about, was absolutely central. Indeed, up until the time of Peter the Great, who came to the throne in 1689, it might be argued, in fact, that Russia was an entirely religious culture. Much substance and much vitality can be found in the Orthodox faith. And the focus is not so much in terms of academic theology as in painting, literature, music, and the spirituality of the monks. Well, from the small rural churches of the countryside to the massive cathedrals of the city, like St. Sophia in Novgorod, the religious presence in the community was in fact evident. Religious belief was at the heart of Russian culture in the 16th and 17th centuries. In this sense, Russia was not unlike its European counterparts of the same period, where we have already learned that religion was fundamental and intrinsic to the fabric of those societies. But more than anything else, being Russian meant adhering to the Orthodox faith. <coughs> that Christian faith, orthodoxy, defined Russian culture. But I'm not just talking about stained glass and soaring impressive cathedrals or sermons or even the ruins of religious houses when I say this. Because religion at the heart of the culture itself meant much more than that. It concerned both the living and the dead. It encompassed the imposing presence of Christianity in the community, but also images and shrines and monuments and beyond that, acts of popular piety, public events, if you will, filled with religious symbolism, all the way to the bizarre aspects of popular culture, and we'll have a little bit of a look at that in the Russian context as we go. Well, the majority of surviving Russian manuscripts are of a religious nature. This one, in fact, dates to 1353. Liturgical homilies, the lives of saints, monastic documents, canon law, which, of course, the Russian church had just as the Latin church had theological tracts, works dealing with heresy. In fact, up to 90% of library holdings were religious in nature. Well, Russian Christianity is the contrast to Reformation 
and Counter-Reformation, which we have previously considered. The Russian Church stood apart from the religious storms which convulsed Latin Christianity in Europe for much of the tumultuous 16th century, because there was no Reformation as such in Russia. It never penetrated past the eastern borders of Europe to the Russian lands. There was little substantial influence, in fact, from the West into Russia before the 16th century. Orthodoxy uh, remained and continued pretty well uninterrupted for centuries. The Russian Orthodox Church marked its millennium in 1988, but there are Byzantine sources which refer to a Russian diocese as early as 867, so the church in Russia has been around for a long time. At the end of the Middle Ages, Russia was the largest Orthodox state not subjected to the rule of Islam. There were other Orthodox states, of course. It alone existed in the Orthodox world beyond the reach of Arab and Ottoman invasion. The other Orthodox states included places like Romania, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, Serbia, Bulgaria, Georgia, Cyprus, and Greece. All of these, though, in one way or another, came under the yoke of Islam, but not Russia. Russia presents us, then, with an intriguing context for looking at religious belief in its political dimensions, the relations between church and political rulers, princes, how and why these rulers appropriated religion to achieve social order. That's part of the brief in this topic. We begin then with the Tsar Ivan IV, 1533 to 1584. Under his rule, the power of the Russian church was greatly increased. Ivan Grozny does not mean terrible in Russian. It means stern, but he's known to us in the West as Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny. He was intelligent, he was active, he was well-read, and Ivan had a remarkable ability for theological speculation. However, he was a considerable liability. He was, well, should I say kindly, a bit unbalanced. He was inclined to insane outbursts and wild excesses of sensuality and cruelty. He is here in this depiction shown ordering the skull cap of an Italian envoy nailed to his head. Ivan did some awful things and while Grozny doesn't mean terrible, the nickname is in fact quite well deserved. And though he was deeply interested in matters of theology and religion and the church, Ivan does not appear to have actively interfered in church affairs. But, consistent with the Byzantine tradition, the church submitted herself completely and absolutely to the ruler of the state who was, in the Byzantine context, considered anointed by God. With that principle in hand, with that principle clearly in place in Russian culture, there was no struggle between the two swords, the spiritual sword, the spiritual sword, we've discussed this in terms of Latin Christianity. Those two swords were always pointed at each other, it seems like in the West, but not in Russia, because the church submitted herself willingly to the state, because the powers of the state were regarded as ordained by God. So the sort of conflict that uh, characterizes Europe uh, is unknown in Russia until the 17th century, of which we will refer to just a little bit later. But speaking now of the relation between the church and the state, it is clear, I think, that the church was very useful to the Russian state. 
in the 16th and 17th centuries. In May 1654, the second Romanov Tsar, Alexei Mikhailovich, rode out from Moscow to make war on Poland and Lithuania, its western neighbors. It was a scene, Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich riding out of Moscow, a scene rivaling uh, medieval military pageantry. The Tsar, aged but 25 years, was preceded by a veritable for forest of banners, including his own, which bore the double-headed eagle and the motto, Fear God and Obey the Tsar. He and his retainers, marching out of Moscow, were magnificently arrayed. One might have thought that rather than going to war, they were actually about to go engage in a process or a procession going to a banquet or some celebration. Even the hooves of the horses were decorated with pearls. A huge, glittering retinue followed. The Patriarch of Moscow, a man by the name of Nikon, sprinkled holy water on the Tsar, his men and their troops, as they passed. Tsar Alexei was going off in a blaze of glory, like an old-fashioned medieval crusader, engaging in holy war, defending God and the faith. Now, the Tsar had been influenced, to be sure, by churchmen, who urged him to regard himself as the new Moses, who would liberate the true believers, that would be the Orthodox, from the unclean hands of Catholics and Protestants and Muslims. They're all unclean. A year earlier, he had drafted a memorandum setting out very clearly his thinking with respect to war. It bore this inscription on military matters, how to protect the true Orthodox Christian faith and the holy ecumenical church and all Orthodox Christians. I mean, what a title for a military document. Allow me to uh, just continue for a moment here. When the battle begins, he told one of the princes, you and your men are to go forth on God's business, listen to the language, God's business, singing, and keep the Jesus prayer in mind. Go into battle joyfully, without any doubting, and your singing will be such that despite yourselves, you will not be defeated and you will seem terrible to the enemy. Now there's a whole undercurrent here of religion and civility mixed together under the banner of militarism. And this indicates, I think, a rather close relationship between the two great institutions. However, lest any misunderstanding enter, there was conflict from time to time between the church and the state. For example, Ivan Grozny, had Metropolitan Philip of Moscow assassinated in the year 1568 because the Metropolitan, on one occasion, refused to allow the Tsar Ivan to approach the cross, saying to him, Sir, why don't you fear God? We are here rendering the bloodless sacrifice for the salvation of the world, but outside the walls of the church, the blood of innocent Christians is being shed, and he was putting his finger upon some of the atrocities and excesses of the Tsar. And Ivan didn't take too well to being called to task and barred from the altar. It should remind us of that great confrontation at Milan, uh, way back in patristic Christianity between Ambrose and Emperor Theodosius, who was refused the sacrament until he made amends. Well, Theodosius made amends, repented, did penance. What did Ivan do? <laughs> he had Philip thrown into jail and later strangled to death. Ivan IV reduced monastic privileges in Russia. And this had particular 
import for the question of property. At the turn of the 15th century, his predecessor, Ivan III, confiscated vast tracts of land in Novgorod, in the west of Russia. These confiscations caused much bitter conflict between the monarch and the clergy. However, the Tsar was obeyed with respect to his wishes concerning church land because everybody feared losing their prestige, their power, being deprived and, shall we say, getting on the bad side of the Tsar who is anointed by God, so let's keep the Tsar happy, shall we? But despite this, between 1552 and 1590, the church acquired 657 land holdings. But how can we explain the failure of Muscovite government to secularize monastic lands when the Europeans were so successful at doing this? I draw your attention to Henry VIII in 16th century England who dissolved the monasteries, kept all of the goods and his Catholic successor Mary who returned to Rome but not to papal primacy and said we're not going to discuss the acquisition of church lands. There's but one example and I could draw attention to many other areas as well. But it's clear that Ivan's confiscation of lands in Novgorod indicates that it was fairly easy for the secular ruler to confiscate ecclesiastical lands whenever he or she wished. But there's no reliable evidence extant to suggest that anyone in the Muscovite state thought seriously or contemplated wholesale secularization of church and monastic lands in the 16th century. The Patriarch of Jerusalem referred to the regent Sophia, the Russian regent Sophia, as a model of virtue and the guardian of the royal scepter defender and champion of the apostolic faith. And indeed, the regent Sophia took quite seriously the religious aspects of her rulership. For the regent, politics and religion were very closely intertwined. She served as regent in Russia between 1682 and 1689. Russian princes were sometimes portrayed as holy men in Russian iconography. The theocratic nature of the Tsar's power, and this is a crucial point for understanding the relation between church and state in early modern Russia, that enabled the sovereign to keep his hand or her hand, as in the case of the regent Sophia, upon ecclesiastical affairs. The, the, the person, the Tsar, the regent, has been anointed by God. Now the term Tsar comes from the word Caesar. It's the Russian equivalent of Caesar, meaning emperor, and was intended, of course, to express the highest form of dominion, the Russian Caesar, like the Roman Caesars. From the time of Ivan IV, the Russian Tsars had the title ruler, Tsar, and Grand Duke. And this was used right up until 1917, when the Romanov dynasty ended with the execution of the Tsar Nicholas II and his family at the outbreak of the Bolshevik Revolution. Well, the will of the prince is the will of God. That was a sentiment not out of place in early modern Russia. The relationship then of the head of the state with the church authorities is even further revealed uh, when we look at the variety of ways in terms of the practice of official religion in Russia to which I want to turn our attention. The Metropolitan of Moscow and the Archbishop of Novgorod were the most powerful personalities in the Russian church hierarchy. Moscow and Novgorod, the two most important cities. Now, the system of patriarchs and metropolitans is an aspect of ecclesiastical or, uh, organization in the East. 
Uh, these are the Russian liturgical vestments, which you can see once belonging to the patriarch Nikon. In Russia, the bishop of a capital was given the title Metropolitan. So Russian Metropolitans are the equivalent of Latin bishops. Indeed, the Novgorod Archbishopric became the sole well-developed and stable institution in the last century of that city-state's existence. It was the only important Russian city that did not fall to the Mongols. However, Novgorod fell as an autonomous city-state in 1478 to Muscovy, to Russia, to Moscow. Now, religious life at the Russian court, let, let's bring the theory now down to some concrete examples and look at Russian religion, Christianity in the Russian court. There are several dimensions. First of all, there was the cycle of the liturgical year, the main festivals, Easter, Christmas, and so on, not unlike the West. On these days, the entire court went to church. How nice. At Easter, the Tsar gave alms to the poor, proclaimed an amnesty to prisoners. The Tsar and the Patriarch would exchange Easter eggs. How charming. The Tsar would pray at the tombs of ancestors, would present his eggs to his confessor and to other clergy. The day would end with a formal reception in the Tsar's palace and the Patriarch and the Boyars would be invited. Now the Russian boyars are the higher nobility, just one step down from the princes, and they were pretty powerful. And at different times in this period, they, as a class, exerted considerable influence in the church. During these festivals, I think it's fair to say the czar was almost as much the main character in the drama as Christ, if you will, and the boyars were almost as if they were the apostles. Now there were two unique festivals in Russian Christianity. One was the Feast of the Blessing of the Waters. This occurred at Epiphany in January, but if you've been to Russia in January, it's hard to bless the waters because they're all frozen and it's very cold in Russia, so they repeated this blessing of the waters in August when it's a bit more palatable. And the second was the Palm Sunday uh, procession. In terms of the former, the blessing of the waters, uh, they did do it in January at Epiphany. The Tsar and the Patriarch would go together in procession, together with the highest ranking uh, civil and ecclesiastical personalities in the realm, and they would go down to the frozen Moscow River. A hole would be cut in the ice, and over this, they would construct a wooden hut. This was to symbolize the baptism of Jesus. The four evangelists were featured in the four corners of the hut on the inside. Uh, icons would be there. And through the hole, the patriarch did not ice fish, no. He plunged a cross into the water. And then water would be taken from the Moscow River back to the Tsar's palace and sprinkled on the icons and throughout the rooms. The Patriarch also sprinkled the banners of the army, and the Tsar, who stood bareheaded, and the boyar. So this is a, a, a big public festivity involving all of the powerful and influential, both of state and of church. The ceremony apparently demonstrated the respect of the Tsar and the boyars, as well as the common people, for the church. Now in the latter ceremony, the Palm Sunday procession, the Tsar would lead the patriarch who was sitting upon a donkey around the Kremlin squares and through the streets from church to church. And in the Kremlin, in Moscow, there are many, many churches and religious buildings. The boyars would follow this procession. Well, these ceremonies were not just religious, they were also political, insofar as they were again underscoring and expressing the unity between the church and the state, 
between the czars and the patriarchs, indeed of all of society. Now, the rhetoric and the dramaturgy suggested unity. And this may have been a thick consensus of the ruler, church, and aristocracy, but notwithstanding, it simply reinforced the perception and the impression of a unity. It also portrayed the czar as the defender of the faith, for there he is, leading the way in these processions, uh, actively involved with the Patriarch of Moscow, who would be the most important personality in the Russian church. By the 16th century, there were efforts to systematically regulate morality and the pattern of religious life. One of these attempts was through, through the, uh, what is called the Demostroi. It's a book on how to conduct oneself in terms of religious observances, morality, and indeed housekeeping. Almost like a, a book of practical canon law, in a sense, like they had in the West. The deathbed tonsure was a common form of monasticism for the elite. I mean, there's no point getting too religious now, is there? No point in actually entering a monastery until you really have to do so. Constantine the Great in 337 waited to be baptized until he was on his deathbed. Some of the Russian elite, as they felt death drawing near, would receive the tonsure, the symbol of the monastic life. And such rites of passage if you will, suggest the way in which the religious life was regarded even from a distance. But what a good thing to do to die as a monk. So I'll take the vows in the last hour of my life. It's also perhaps less a form of official religion than an expression of popular religion. The Russian church of the 17th century had to contend, though, with its own schism. I mentioned that the Reformation bypassed Russia, and it certainly did, but there was a schism within orthodoxy in Russia in the 17th century, and it did have to say something about what they called the Latin heresy, which was, in fact, the Reformation. Now, I've mentioned the patriarch Nikon of Moscow. His dates are 1605 to 1681. He attempted to gain some, uh, some support for reforming views that he felt very strongly about. One, that the priesthood was higher than Tsardom, the priesthood more important than the Tsar. He taught that unction certainly comes from God, but it comes to the Tsar through the clergy. Huh. The clergy, however, were unprepared for this kind of radical thinking, and Nikon could not prevail. The Russian approach was completely different. It was the church beneath the czar, the unction coming through the czar to the clergy, not the other way around. As a matter of consequence, Nikon was stripped of his office and banished. Such reforming views could not find any root in Russian culture and had to be simply put down. Domestic dissenters, those in Russia were on extremely dangerous ground. There is no parallel history of heresy in Russia such as there is in the West. Now there were heretical movements, the Strigalniki in the later 14th and early 15th century, uh, the Judaizers at the turn of the 16th century, and that's about it. A comparison of heresy in the West, as we have seen in some detail, Valdensians, Cathars, Lollards, Hussites, and a bunch of other people, were not to be found in Russia. Dissenters in Russia were on dangerous ground because it was regarded as rebellion against the stake. The mandatory, mandatory penalty for apostasy was burning at the stake or being buried alive. Sophia's government, the regent in the 16, uh, 1680s, 
responded very quickly and very harshly to religious dissent. Ecclesiastical synods, councils, sitting in 1666 and 67, had excommunicated the dissenters. Another synod, during her first year of regency, 1682, declared that the schism in Russia had both ecclesiastical and civil implications, and as such was subject to official inquiry by both legislative bodies. Well, that provided the regent Sophia with the necessary legitimation for action. Religious dissent, of course, threatened the unity of the church every bit as much as it threatened the stability of the state. It could not be tolerated. It threatened civil order in a fundamental way, and the regent was not prepared to tolerate it, not for a single moment. So, in 1683, moving quickly, the leaders of the schism are sent to the stake. The old believers, as they were called, were apprehended and punished. Now, these old believers, as they are called, dissented from the liturgical reforms that had been initiated by the aforementioned patriarch Nikon i.e., he wanted people to make the sign of the cross with three fingers in the Greek fashion instead of two fingers. Oh, no, we are not going to have such innovation, said the old believers. We shall make the sign of the cross with two fingers, only symbolizing the two natures of Christ, not this triadic Trinitarian symbol of the cross. Nay, they wanted to hold to the old beliefs, and so they did. One of them, the archpriest Avakum, was exiled, imprisoned underground for 12 years, because not was he going to make the sign of the cross in such a fashion. And finally, his recalcitrance took him to the stake, where he was burned alive for his stand for old beliefs. Yes, sir, in Russia we will not have innovation. That schism, I digress to tell you, has yet to be repaired even in the 21st century. There are still Russian old believers, and they make the sign of the cross with two fingers, not with three. Well, the discovery of a network of underground heretics in the region of Novgorod resulted in the further execution of some 20 people. Sophia heard some of these cases in person and was present for the announcement of the sentence of death on some of the leaders. She was there, actively involved in the process. The interrogations took place under torture, and sources tell us that regular executions occurred at the place of proclamations, which we know as Red Square in Moscow, right outside the Kremlin. Penalties for religious dissent were very severe, as I have mentioned. These included flogging, torture, the stake, because, to repeat myself, adherence to heresy and dissent had been declared a crime against the state. Once again, I'm drawing your attention, as I have in previous lectures, to the complete amalgamation between church and state. There was no meaningful separation of the two in Russia at this time. Well, this gave rise, this repression, this uh, rigid no to any change at all, gave rise to a lot of self-immolations in Russia. In 1685, 30 people committed suicide near the Kunitsky Monastery in the Novgorod province. Four years later, in 1689, another group set fire to the building that they were in as the government troops closed in to capture them. Other groups fled to Siberia, to the Urals, that great Russian mountain range, and into the far north where they persisted in continuing the practice of their faith in the face of opposition. Now, while there was a measure of toleration extended 
to foreign heretics within Russia, there were strong feelings expressed about Latin Christianity. An anonymous track entitled Against the Latins and the Lutherans reads like this, and I want to read just a few lines from that particular document. It is not fitting that either stone or wooden Latin chapels or Lutheran prayer houses should be built in the Muscovite state. Just as it is not fitting that those corruptors, notice the language, those corruptors of the Orthodox faith, those false teachers, the Latin priest, and the Lutheran and Calvinist pastors should be in Russia at all and teach their heresy with their secret cunning for such heretical Lutheran and Latin buildings are impious and vile, an abomination of desolation standing on the holy soil of the holy Russian land. Well, that's strong language. The imagery is all in place. Uh, we are standing apart and above all of these other corruptors of the faith, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Jews, whatever, we are the true church and we are not going to have those fellows coming onto our holy soil in our holy country and building their unholy churches in order to teach their unholy faith. Not, or, uh, not in my time. And this was the attitude by both the czars and the orthodox churchmen. Now speaking of popular religion, the religious beliefs and practices of the common people, we can build upon the foundations of medieval Russia and suggest four main aspects to the idea of popular religion. First we have the popular cult of the saints, which was very significant in Russia. Uh, folk poetry and the impact of Christianity upon it, a coexistence of Christian and pagan beliefs, and then finally heresy that I've been speaking of. Well, the Russian church actively promoted the first one, that is the saints. They offered support for the second, uh, the impact of Christianity upon folk poetry. They, shall we say, fitfully tolerated the third, this uh, union of pagan and Christian beliefs, but they fought against and eventually suppressed the last, the heresies. The Stoglov Council of 1551 condemned the festivals of carnival, midsummer. Such devilish songs and dancing and jumping about were felt only to lead to excesses of sexuality and orgies in the river, in the river, and were not to be tolerated. And then we have holy fools a special Russian institution, a type of popular saint virtually unknown in Western Christianity. These people wore outrageous clothes and they engaged in outrageous conduct. They pretended to be mad, but they were really social critics and they attracted a great deal of attention. Let me tell you of one holy fool only. His name is Basil the Blessed. He died in 1552. He walked naked through the streets of Moscow, threw stones at the homes of the rich and famous, and he wept over the sinners. He encountered the Tsar, Ivan Grozny, who had destroyed Novgorod. He convinced the terrible Tsar that the souls of the people that he had slain in Novgorod were being received in heaven. The Tsar listened to the shrewd wisdom of the holy fool in Christ, and would you believe that the colorful cathedral in Red Square, Moscow is dedicated to this St. Basil the Blessed. St. Basil's Cathedral is dedicated to Basil the Blessed, the naked holy fool who accosted Ivan the Terrible and got away with it. Fools became common in Russia and like Basil, they were critics of the misdeeds of the rulers. The later 15th to the later 17th centuries represented continuous change in religious culture. The bishops were not entirely successful. 
the boyars by this point seem to have retreated from the center stage of religious activity. There was a rise in miracle cults, a rise in the interest in relics in Russia at this time, and pilgrimages to holy places by townspeople and the peasantry widely evidenced, and shrines became a popular focus of religion at the grassroots level. These were the patterns of religious life then. When in August 1689, Peter the Great came to the Russian throne. But the time of troubles in the 17th century may perhaps be seen as a watershed calling into question the prevailing religious ethos. This cartoon entitled The Mice Burying the Cat appears on Peter's death and it really expresses the resentment of the old Russians, the old believers, and other victims of Peter's reign uh, when they came face to face with the intractability of the regime. The rise of the cults could in some cases be seen as a joint venture of monastic and civil authorities. Indeed, an example would be the 14th century Saint Sergius, whose cult was seen and perceived uh, and promoted as one of the ways forward whereby independence and national unity could come to Muscovy. Chronicles, speaking again of popular religion and concrete expressions of religion, refer to 19, a total of 19 one-day votive churches built between 1390 and 1552. There's 10 of these in Novgorod, 9 in Piskov, another city in uh, western Russia, and there's four more that we know about from other sources. Now these votive churches are wooden, and they were built in 24 hours by communal efforts. People got together and put a church up in 24 hours. On several occasions, we know the Tsar, or the Grand Prince, ordered the construction of these votive churches, and they were a uniquely Russian response to the deadly kiss of the Black Death, which came to Russia time and again, just as it did to Europe. In 1492, the Metropolitan referred to Moscow as the new Constantinople. And indeed, after Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453, the Metropolitan of Moscow took the place of the Patriarch, claiming to be the defender of Orthodox Christians everywhere. This brings us to perhaps one of the most important aspects of religion and church in Christian Russia, and it is this notion of the Third Rome. There are three events in the second half of the 15th century that contribute to the emergence of Moscow as the Third Rome, a place of preeminence in the religious world. The first one, of course, the Turks took Constantinople in 1453, and ever since then, Constantinople has been Istanbul, and it's a Muslim city. Secondly, there was the breakup of the Empire of the Golden Horde. Here we see Genghis Khan. And thirdly, the emergence of Muscovy as a major Northeast European power. It put Novgorod down. It threatened Poland and Lithuania. Now these events were perceived by some as providential. And pretty soon a theory begins to emerge to support that. And the new theory was simply this. Moscow is the third Rome. Now this idea of a third Rome came from here in a letter by a monk of Piskov in the early years of the 16th century to Tsar Vasily III. that I want to read just an extract from that particular document. The church of the old Rome fell because of the Apollinarian heresy. The gates of the second Rome, which was Constantinople, 
have been hewn down by the axes of the infidel Turks. But the present church of the third new Rome of your sovereign empire shines in the universe more resplendent than the sun. All the empires of the Orthodox Christian faith have come together in your single empire. You are the sole emperor of all the Christians in the whole universe. Two Romes have fallen, but the third stands, and a fourth shall not be. Now, several medieval sources have been uncovered, any or all of which may be used as the foundation for this particular idea as Moscow emerging as the preeminent Christian city in all the world. One is the legend of the white cowl. Now, the legend of the white cowl was that Emperor Constantine gave the Bishop of Rome a white cowl. A cowl is the hood of a monk as a symbol of the purity of the Christian faith. When Rome committed apostasy, as it surely did from an orthodox perspective by the 11th century, the cowl was passed to the patriarch of Constantinople. But when Constantinople fell into, the, into ruins at the hand of the infidel Turks, and the Archbishop of Novgorod inherited the white cowl. So we got it. We represent the purity of the Christian faith. There's a number of distinct elements. The transition from Constantinople to Moscow. The transition from Rome to Moscow via Constantinople. There's scriptural bases that were trotted out to support this particular notion. Now, in the domain of internal politics, this idea, of course, played a very serious role in terms of the elevation of the state, the notion that the patriarch of Moscow was the protector of true Christians everywhere, and Muscovite diplomats going to the West portrayed the same particular view in their relations with the states of the West. It's intriguing to note, I think, that the donation of Constantine, which Lorenzo de Valla debunked in the 15th century, came into widespread use in Muscovy in the second half of the 15th century, after de Valla, and its popularity would persist to the 18th century. The patriarch Nikon proclaimed himself Russian by birth, but Greek by faith, and the past of the Muscovite church was condemned. You see, so now there's a question that perhaps the third Rome has been corrupted as well. And the old believers who I mentioned earlier, they considered the third Rome, like the first and the second Romes, to have fallen into heresy. This time it was the Nikonian heresy. Nikon for them was the precursor of the Antichrist, whom they discovered in Peter the Great. Again, I refer you to the cartoon of the mice burying the cat. And this third Rome has transmuted from the Christian empire into the empire of Antichrist. And so now the old believers, apparently, are the fourth Rome. In 1589, when the Metropolitan of Moscow was consecrated Patriarch. The ceremony conducted by the Patriarch of Constantinople used the very words which I cited above. This third Rome, this idea of the third Rome, the idea connected to the concept of the purity of the faith, which the Russians felt very certain that they alone had preserved in all the world, the empire was restored at Moscow because that city had been faithful to the true faith. All of this, I assure you, was part of national consciousness in 16th century Muscovy. But to what extent this was taken seriously by contemporaries? Well, that's pretty difficult to say and virtually impossible to even speculate upon. <clears throat> 
But be that as it may, it does serve as an important indicator of several developments which we are aware of. First, the formation of an official ideology of the Muscovite autocracy. This idea that we are first and foremost in matters of faith and religion and the church. And there was a transformation at length of the dissenters into supporters of the crown. And when I speak of dissenters, I mean specifically the Josephites, who were so named because they followed the abbot Joseph of Volokolamsk, uh, one of the famous abbots of the 15th century. And thirdly, the growth of Western influences in Russia can be detected. And this will change Muscovy and the Russian church from its position of isolation into more of an international form of Christianity. Despite all of this, the third one, the white cowl, the piety, and the, the deeply held beliefs of the Russian Christians, we can detect a perceptible decline in official religion in Russia. The 16th and the 17th centuries then witnessed great changes in religion. I've referred to the seeds of change, but these seeds once planted would bring forth a harvest that even the all-powerful Russian church and state could not forever resist. And this change took place even amongst the Russian elites. Up until the mid-16th century, religious ritual, as I've commented upon, revolved largely around the court and its rituals. But in the course of the 16th century, there's a, a shifting, a transition, if you will, from the centrality of the court to the miracle cults, the public piety, popular religion that we begin to see almost everywhere in Russia. And by the time Sophia took the reins of political affairs in 1682, there existed a serious conflict between the church and the uh, society, if you will. The idea of Moscow as a third Rome was becoming much more difficult to maintain in the emerging modern world that Russia was being drawn along in the stream with. Well, the Orthodox Church of Medieval Russia was essentially a monastic church. In other words, monks, the religious, were the principal figures and personality. But this also began to decline in the 16th century with, again, several important consequences. The church had to strengthen its authority then in response amongst the ranks of bishops, metropolitans, and priests. Monasteries became identified with the common people and less with the elite. The cult of monastic saints, by consequence, declined proportionately. And the commensurate rise in the popular cults, the miracle types of uh, cults, uh, would begin to replace this monastic identity. The church in Russia then had to face and deal with the decline in the importance and the significance of monasticism and also with the religious houses, which came to be regarded as politically neutral territory. They were political neutral territories, but they begin to be used for political purposes. For example, convents became the holding place for potentially dangerous political women. The wife of Tsar Vasily III became, in the end, one of Russia's most famous holy women. An interesting development because she was dragged to the Pokrovsky convent kicking and screaming in 1525 for the same reasons that Henry VIII would get rid of his wife less than a decade later. Vasily wanted to divorce her. He was interested in someone else, but the Russian clergy forbade it. What to do? Force her to take the veil. Make her be a nun. Then I'm rid of her. She's just married Jesus. God be praised. I can get married again. This was the thinking. But there were stories that she had a child, 
shortly after being confined in the cloister. That is to say, she was pregnant by Vasily, and he didn't know it when he put her away. Now there's an heir to the throne. This will never do. The child turned up dead one day in the convent. Alas, how tragic. Actually, I think it was a carefully orchestrated state plan to preclude the emergence of a, an heir that was unwanted. This widely circulated story threw suspicion on the legitimacy of Ivan IV's succession. You see his coronation here, being showered with gold coins. Sophia, the regent of Russia herself, was dispatched to another convent on the outskirts of Moscow in 1689 by Peter the Great, who considered her too important a political rival to be left to run around. And the first wife of Peter the Great was put into a cart in 1698, which rattled off to the same Pokrovsky convent, and yet another woman put away for fear of her influence. And so the convents were sometimes viewed as protectors of the community, with their imposing physical structures, the walls with battlements, the ready garrisons, the fact that they were constructed on the outskirts of towns, designed to be fortresses. They had garrisoned troops often. And by the mid-17th century, the monks are in decline and the sermon is on the rise. Well, myth shapes history, as well as distorts history. The idea of the Third Rome was one such myth. As the power of the government grew, the myth increased. The myth evolved as a sort of justification, if you will, for the state. Myths about the kindness and the goodness of the, of the czar and the people is reflected in the Russian religious literature, and it grows together steadily. The czar becomes all the more the important link between God and the holy people of holy Russia. The church did considerably to support and facilitate these particular myths and beliefs. Yet, when they were tested in the crises of the 16th century and throughout the time of troubles, these beliefs survived. I think a testimonial to the very deep roots in the popular consciousness. And so, religion and church in Russia stood strong despite all of this, rooted and grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ, remaining firm upon the rock.